It says you're live. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Danielle Anderson. Everyone will kind of go through introductions. I know um, everyone was excited to come down. We should be celebrating tonight that everyone's done exams and ready to go back home and finish our studies and our certification. Um, unfortunately, we've been derailed by COVID. Um, so you would have met us when you came down to Colorado or came to the um, intensive in Colorado. Um, so we thought we would go through uh, at least some introductions, which um, you would have seen when you were there. And then we can uh, answer any questions if you're struggling with certain points um, or just want to talk about any clarifications, uh, we can hopefully help with that. So um, anyone who's not in Colorado right now, I'm in Ontario, Canada, and I have SOAR Veterinary Services, which is a rehab and pain management clinic. Um, I graduated from the acupuncture patient course in 2016, and um, I normally get to come down and see guys a couple times a year uh, for the exams, and so I'm kind of sad that I'm not there, um, but hope to come down later in October and see everybody. Um, acupuncture has made a huge difference to the outcomes of our patients, and I know Currently, we're having um, to only see essential and urgent and painful cases. And so acupuncture is probably um, the majority of what I'm doing throughout my days right now, uh, because I would say that's how I'm controlling a lot of these patients and neurologic patients, uh, their pain and um, improving their quality of life. So to remove those things um, isn't ethical. And so that continuing to see them. Um, so I think we have lots to that we can talk to you guys about on um, practice and uh, moving forward, but um, that is what I do and that is where I am from and um, whoever wants to go next can take it away. Go for it, Alyssa. Okay, hi, I am Alyssa Edoff. I am a 2015 grad and graduated from the acupuncture course in 2016. Um, I have a mobile practice doing canine rehab and acupuncture for both large and small animals. And that's exclusively what I do. I don't do any general practice anymore. I've been doing that a little over two years full time um, and was in a rehab practice prior to that for a little over a year as their only acupuncturist. Um, COVID's been a challenge doing house calls. Obviously, I'm not going into anyone's homes at the moment, but um, it's actually worked quite well doing things outside. A lot of the patients have been really cooperative, um, seeing probably about a third of my normal cases. But again, being acupuncture pain management, um, I do think that a lot of them are essential. And owners are just really grateful that I'm still willing to, to come and help. Yeah, I think that's a little bit kind of intro for me. Um. I'm Nancy Bureau. Hello. Um, and I am in, uh, I um, co own a practice in beautiful, sunny downtown Niwak, Colorado. And it's called Left Hand Animal Hospital. I'm, I'm saying it that way. Uh, the town I work in is less than 2,000 people. Um, the majority of the people that we see don't come from that town, they come from the surrounding towns around to come see us. Um, Technically, I'm a general practitioner. Um, we see animal, pup, puppies and kittens and fuzzy little creatures for vaccinations, wellness exams, generally stuff like that. Um, but the majority of what we would, what we do is second opinion work um, for um, for multimodality work. Uh, we have a lot of the um, uh, internal medicine specialists, oncologists, um, uh, orthopedic surgeons will refer animals in that need multiple modalities to help care for them. Classically, what we see is like the um, cat with HCM and arthritis and kidney disease, and somebody's got to be the case manager um, and figure out what things can, can be done. Because of that, we do a lot of acupuncture. We do some rehab also. Um, I'm rehab certified. Um, uh, acupuncture honestly runs our practice. Um, acupuncture um, honestly has uh, been a huge gift um, 
There are, um, oh, I, I'm losing count here. Um, there's uh, four of us full time, four doctors full time, two part time. And of those doctors, um, there's four that do acupuncture. Um, it's, it drives our practice. Um, acupuncture probably um, ends up being about 50% of our patient load. Um, uh, and we, um, we incorporate it to virtually everything we do. Uh, even the doctors that don't know how to perform acupuncture know when to prescribe it and so that we get a lot of in-house referrals for things. Um, in this um, COVID time, um, uh, as we're asked to do essential works only, acupuncture, just like um, Danny would tell you, acupuncture truly has made a huge difference as to how many patients we are able to see um, because acupuncture is considered an essential modality for pain control or for disease control. Um, we, um, these past few weeks, the majority of what we've been doing is acupuncture alone. Um, um, acupuncture can make a world of difference to your practice. Um, I'm happy to talk to anybody who has questions um, about how to talk to your boss about incorporating acupuncture into your practice or uh, the financial aspect of acupuncture in a, in a general practice. And then Misha knows everything about time frames and knows everything else that I didn't say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm Misha Venture. I'm co-owner of a small animal <laughs> animal practice in Westminster, so about an hour away from Nancy. She and I were vet school classmates, and uh, we've both been doing this for a long time. Um, he, she was a huge mentor for me, too, um, so thank you, um, in starting up our business. And just like Nancy said, um, I, acupuncture is part of my every single day, and whether it is a second opinion referral for pain management or neurologic conditions because everybody hates neuro except for the neurologist um and so or if it's just for other general things um it's just made a huge difference not only to the quality of care that i can provide for those patients but because i see exotics i'm able to expand the knowledge um, of acupuncture treatment to a, a very wide variety of species and People may not want to spend three or four hundred dollars on a surgery for a rat, but they'll spend 40 bucks, you know, to make it more comfortable for a period of time. So it's just made a huge difference in all of my patients. So I'm really excited you guys are here and all the opportunities that will be in your future, um, especially once we are able to come together and be able to touchy feely and be fondling um, once again. And that's how we learn. So I'm excited. Thanks for coordinating this too, Danielle. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks very much. And if I can jump in, um, oh, no problem. can answer all of your questions about exotics. Um, so, <laughs> you know, often there's questions about that, but Misha's your, your person for that. I try. You do a great job. Um, thanks. So we can talk about kind of how we've altered practice we can also maybe talk about some of the more common questions we get when we do come down um, I know we get a lot of business questions as far as um, how do you make it work like I said Nancy how do you integrate that into regular practice um, how do you I guess make a business plan if you are working for somebody else um, or how do you start a mobile practice so we I guess we could talk a bit about some of that um yes um, <laughs> um yes we can um yeah um, so i um the when i uh the most common questions i get about general practice and please jump in anywhere please anybody um uh is how do you <laughs> talk to your boss about this. Um, and then Alyssa is a great resource for how do you um, uh, move from general practice into doing your own house call practice. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in, in general practice, I would encourage you to sit down and talk with your boss. Um, and I don't know if you can record what I'm currently saying, but if you want, you're welcome to uh, record this and uh, show it to your boss. Um, if you need somebody to reach out to, I'm happy to to um, be a sounding board for you. 
um, the most common questions we get are about how do you talk to your boss about this? Um, Cause your boss is gonna say, hey, um, this um, acupuncture sounds great, but how much time do you need? And how much, um, what are you gonna get for income? And you're gonna need to prove to your boss that this is actually a practice builder. And you're gonna need to prove to your boss that this is financially viable. Um, uh, Cause I understand that a lot of um, us in, as associates it turns into, hey, how many, how much, um, how many dollars per patient hour are you pulling in for the practice? Um, uh, you can use great buzzwords with your, um, with your practice owner, um, things like um, bond-centered practice, um, acupuncture. This is one of the things that uh, veterinary medicine is talking about. And during coronavirus times is going to be incredibly important. Um, it's going to be that you'll want to build bonds with pet parents so that they know you they trust you so that their animals are happy to come in and see you um, because that means they will come find you. Um, so acupuncture helps us as a, as a team to do bond centered practice. Those pet parents are incredibly bonded to us because you help them so much. Um, and uh, so I encourage you to talk to your boss about that. And then financially, um, if you look at per dollar hour, um, acupuncture sometimes doesn't look like it's building cash. Um, I would tell you that we charge, we're not allowed to talk about costs, um, like a dollar amount at all, because that's um, price fixing. Um, but we charge based roughly on what an hour's worth of practice would would um, cost a client, um, an hour's worth of our exam room time. So whatever your exam room fee, you might use that as a basis. You might go up or down a bit from there. Call around if there's other practices around you that um, perform acupuncture for animals. Um, just do a little cost comparison if you choose to. Um, you don't have to put your prices based on other practices, but it might give you a, a ballpark as to where you might um, place that, that fee structure. And then honestly, the big way we end up um, um, having this work for us financially, enough so that we could hire a sixth doctor truly mostly for her acupuncture skills and for her fear-free status is that um, these clients, they, um, they'll come in for acupuncture. Um, you'll help their pet, um, their pet will get better. And then they build this bond with you, they trust you. And so if you ask them to do something else, hey, your pet's also taking Rimadyl or your pet's on blood pressure medicine, can we do these additional tests? Um, they're more likely to say yes, because they already trust you. They know that you're in it with them. They know that you're there to help them and help their pet live good lives. And then you end up seeing these clients more frequently through the year, right? So the average acupuncture patient, it depends on what you're treating them for, but you might treat them, um, oh, once a week for three or four weeks, and then maybe every other week for a while, and then every fourth week for a while. Um, even if you're seeing these patients three to 12 times per year, that's um, revenue building, right? It's bond building, it's revenue building. They keep coming in. Um, and so you'll be able on a per client transaction basis. Um, again, those are great words to use with practice owners. Um, you're going to be um, building huge revenue. So instead of it being that you see these pet parents once a year for an exam, uh, basic blood works and maybe some vaccinations, you're going to end up seeing for whatever that costs you, you're going to end up seeing these patients um, be able to do better medicine because you see them more frequently. Um, that matches all of our mission statements as veterinarians to do good in this world, um, to help these animals live happy lives, to help these pet parents enjoy time with their animals. And you'll be able to see them multiple times during the year for acupuncture and their blood works and maybe their x-rays or their ultrasounds, um, additional medications, things like that, supplements, all of those things. So it becomes an enormous practice builder. Wow, that's a lot of words. <laughs> And, and I know if you're showing this to your business. Uh, yeah. To everyone that hates neuro, I would say neuro. Neuro is probably my favorite cases that we see because they, like, you look like you perform miracles sometimes because they go from nodding and, you know, severely painful to walking out and, you know, improving relatively quickly sometimes. So I would say seniors because I get to see them, you know, they come in last minute, they're like, 
you know, we're looking at potentially putting them to sleep. Is there anything you can do? And we're like, well, let's try some laser and acupuncture. Let's see what we can do. And instead of getting a couple months, we're getting a couple of years, right? You know, we're getting like 16 year old dogs that, you know, we're able to maintain. And sometimes we're seeing these dogs weekly for those two years, sometimes a little bit, we try and extend that interval, but you know, it builds this huge bond. And instead of just, you know, building that bond with it and, and the patient, you end up building a family. Like I'm, I continue to be friendly with um, clients long after we lose that patient. And uh, I think it's probably one of my favorite, favorite things between that and neuro. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, and I totally, about what acupuncture can do. Yeah, and I totally agree with you now. But when I graduated that school, mm -hmm. neuro was my least favorite mm -hmm. thing because I wasn't confident in it. And so thankfully that the math totally. course, because we – um relearn and we learn in a different way really how to assess these patients more comprehensively and um from a little bit of a different angle neurologically it's not grinding on their spine it's not hopping them all over the place like we learn so many other more realistic and gentle techniques to be able to assess them. And so now I agree with you. Yeah, neuro cases are super fun and super awesome. But when I first graduated vet school and up until I took math in 2006, I hated neuro. It was so scary because I didn't fully understand it. And now having a different way to go about it makes it so Agreed. much more practical. I'll kind of expand on that with um, the mobile aspect too. I've had several uh, local practices that I dropped off pamphlet pamphlets too and had never really gotten any referrals and then all of a sudden I get these down dachshunds that they're saying you know they don't want to go to CSU for surgery we've kind of ran out of options so go try her as a last resort guess what those dogs are doing fantastic and now I get more and more referrals from that practice because they see what a great job I've done and what a difference I've made for those patients and then those clients also go back to that practice speak really highly of me and you know they the clinics can just see what a difference you're making and then they start to trust you. Um, and I, as a mobile practitioner as well, I made the choice not to um, take business from clinics. So I try to work really closely with my referring vet. So if I feel like there's um, a necessary medication change that could be made, I'm in contact with those vets too and trying to make a relationship with both veterinarians and my clients so that we can make the best kind of plan for those patients and the best outcomes long-term. Do we have any um, And questions? to answer, Nancy, you talked about, uh, I don't see any questions other than Narda's comments at this point. No, that's um, all I can but see I, well. I, I can upload then. this. Like if, if, we answer a bunch of what we think my, people might be worried about. I can upload this to YouTube and they can access it um, at okay. another date as okay. well. Okay. Um, I guess so. Uh, the other, uh, anything else? Well, I guess yeah. I was just thinking from a mobile perspective, there's several kind of options for going on your own because I worked full time at another practice and then did it on the side until I was ready to go full time. Um, and then also I've done contract work for a clinic, um, as well. So I don't know if that's something that anyone would be interested in. If I could, I could go into a little bit more on that. Yes, please. Um, so yeah, you just really need to establish mm -hmm. with your boss that they're okay with you seeing patients outside of it. Um, and then I spent days off going and, um, visiting other clinics and dropping off pamphlets and just trying to make a name for myself. And then, um, you know, I would see those patients and eventually you just get busier and busier that I cut my hours down until I was able to go full time. Um, and then doing the contract work is you really have to establish a good percentage that makes it worth your time. Um, that was one difficulty that I ran into is that I don't think I was making enough of an income for me to make it worth my time. And then the practice wasn't booking me enough appointments. Um, but again, I got busy enough and I would, you know, I wasn't really in contact with those clients and I couldn't see things beforehand. So 
I think it's just really important to have that good relationship with other veterinarians that are doing that. Right. And can you explain more about what you mean by contract work? Um, you'd be renting a room or a space in another person's practice, stuff like that? Yes, yeah, I was an independent contractor for a local GP clinic um, and just went in and only did acupuncture. So it was all in-house referrals to me from that practice. Um, and then I established, you know, a protocol with that client and then the uh, clinic would schedule appointments for me. Um, so then I would just call in on the day and say, Hey, do I have any patients today? Um, I only had like set hours, certain days of the week. Um, so that got tough too, cause you know, there were days I'd call in and the week before I'd looked ahead at my schedule and had two or three patients on my schedule. So I only worked about two hours there. Um, and then everyone would have canceled and nobody updates me and I don't know why people are canceling. So it's just, you really have to have a good, good relationship and a lot of good communication. And just didn't really have it there. But that would be probably if I could go back and redo, it would be establishing that better. And I, I tried, I'd gone in and done my presentation that I've done for practices and you just have to find the right fit for you. All right. Thanks. That's, that's good details. Yeah. Um, and then practice building, um, I totally share that um, I, I make jokes. I know I'm never funny. I always have this flat tone. I don't really have intonation to my voice at all. Um, I think you're hysterical, um, actually. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank <laughs> you. Um, I, uh, but I make jokes um, that my team actually, um, as much as I, I as as I, much as I co-own a practice, I make jokes that I show up and my team actually just tells me what to do. Um, the way we created that was to um, make sure that our team, um, um, their pets get acupuncture and uh, physical therapy and cold laser therapy at no cost to them. Um, this is a practice builder in and of itself because they're the people who are talking, picking up the phone, talking to people, checking parents, pet parents in, checking pet parents out. Um, and so they're the ones that are saying, hey, have you tried acupuncture? Hey, did you did acupuncture really help your pet? And oh, did, did Nancy talk to you about a cold laser um, therapy option? Um, you ought to talk to her about that next time you're in. Um, so um, like Alyssa talked about doing a presentation to your team um, and encouraging, hey, look, um, you'll do acupuncture or cold laser therapy rehab works um, at no cost for their pets, their personal pets can be a practice builder. And um, uh, we, Alyssa did this and we did this and I think Misha did this too. We reached out to the specialists in the area and offered to do presentations for their teams, not not free services for their teams, but, um, right. but, um, but uh, presentations. And uh, honestly, sure, the specialists refer pets in, but off, just as often it's their front desk teams that will say, hey, you've got that down dachshund. I know you saw our neurologist. Here's a card. Um, if, if surgery is not an option for you, um, go reach out to Nancy. Um, and uh, they'll see those animals back and they're doing so much better. Um, this week I saw some really fun cases um, as you're talking about neuro. Um, I've seen, uh, I started a couple of cases with uh, lumbosacral stenosis dogs and a really cool facial paralysis dog, um, um, bilateral, unfortunately. Um, um, and I totally, um, I, those those cases are um, practice building cases um, also. They're, they're really fun uh, from a neurologic standpoint, from an acupuncture standpoint. They're fun for our whole team. They're compassion um, uh, relief, um, uh, compassion fatigue relief for our team because those pets do so well. Um, and uh, it ends up um, being a beautiful addition to our practice. Yeah. Nancy, you um, got a big one in terms of therapy, therapeutic laser. And I think that, you know, a lot of um, practices right now do have therapy lasers, um, but most people just don't necessarily know all the ins and outs and how to set them and, and really what benefit it's providing for their pets. And so I think that through this course and hopefully through the modules, everybody got a little bit of inf more information on um, low level laser light therapy 
Um, and we all have our favorites. And, and I think that um, there's so thankfully so many different options out there to fit everybody's needs. You know, for a, a mobile person like Alyssa, carrying around a huge companion laser is not very practical. But, you know, to be able to have a really versatile um, laser in your practice is really, really helpful because, like you said, as a practice builder for staff members and um, for them to be able to experience the benefit on their own pet firsthand and be able to share that information. Number one, it saves you time from having to go through it with a client and allows um, not just the doctor to have that trusting bonded relationship with the client, but the whole staff, um, because then everybody, it can be part of teamwork and um, it's not just one person's, um, you know, investment into that pet. Right. Um Yes, um, I would. I think I know all of us would tell you that um, laser therapy can help um, a lot of our animal friends. When I talk to veterinarians at class about laser therapy, I usually go around in a group and ask, "What would you treat with a laser?" Um, and um, uh, a good basic thought could be, um, you know, know what a laser does, know how we, um, what we know about how laser therapy works, um, pick whatever your favorite laser is, pick a good quality one, um, uh, learn how to use it um, so that you can use it well. Um, when I meet some veterinarians that have lasers, they don't use it very much, mostly because they didn't learn how to use it. Um, um, but um, so, um, you learn how to, to use your laser um, and then think about treating virtually anything that ends in itis. Um, okay, you can't treat um, uh, you can't treat conjunctivitis, right? Because then you're pointing a laser at an eyeball. Um, you can't treat blepharitis, okay, because you're pointing things at an eyeball. Um, you can't treat, oh, um, uh, basically don't treat an eyeball. Um, uh, uh, but any other itis, think about using <laughs> So especially with the current state of affairs, there's a lot of people at home too who may be immune suppressed and may be not able to be going out and get it, even though we're still and their their patient or their pet may be urgent, we can't get them into the hospital. So these, some of these patients where I normally would see for acupuncture and laser, we're kind of trying to find alternatives. And a CC loop is a, a huge part of that. Um, we have a lot of people that are picking those up. And the other thing we were talking about, and I heard of these from Dr. Robinson, um, was the Luma suits. So because they're really inexpensive, um, LED lasers as for people to use at home um, we've been incorporating that into their pain control even if it means we can kind of extend their intervals that they're coming into the hospital because of the COVID stuff um, that's definitely something else people can look at. right yeah um, um, and when um, you start the other uh, question we used to get oh no you go <laughs> Um, I was going to say, I felt like you were going to go along the same theme, so I was going to let yes. you run with it. Um, yeah, so when you start acupuncture, a lot of people kind of are nervous, worried, scared. Um, uh, I love acupuncture for lots of reasons. Um, I love it because it, it did make me go back and relearn anatomy. Anatomy uh, was a long, long, long time ago. I took it with Misha and I'm, um, I, I, it was a long time ago. Um, and, and I love it because it made me relearn my muscles, um, my ligaments, my tendons, um, all of those things, and it made me relearn neuroanatomy. Um, so that's a great thing. Those are huge benefits. Um, and when we, when I first started doing acupuncture, I know what I did was I palpated every single anesthetized patient that we had. 
Um, so, um, and then I would um, ask permission, but I would acupuncture every anesthetized patient. It didn't necessarily mean I did it for free. It was incorporated as part of their pain control um, for every dental, for every spay. Um, uh, so it gave me hands-on practice with someone that held still so I could learn to trust my hands um, and to learn to um, place my acupuncture points as accurately as possible. Um, and then um, moved into, uh, within a short amount of time, um, learned, moved into um, treating other patients. Um, if you can have patients with yourself, uh, when I talk about learning about acupuncture, I think all the way back um, into vet school, you know, um, uh, we all remember uh, palpating abdomen after abdomen after abdomen. And then that first a very exciting day when you did a little happy dance and you said, I found a spleen, I found a spleen. Um, and uh, then you kept going back over and over again and feeling that spleen and feeling that spleen and feeling that spleen. And then that really exciting moment when you said, oh my gosh, there's a liver that lives next to the spleen. And you could find that also. <laughs> So um, doing acupuncture palpations is kind of like that. Remember how many abdomens it took you to get that palpatory skill. It's going to take you um, a little bit of practice. Um, try to give yourself at least 100 patients that you, that you palpate um, before you um, start saying, hey, look, um, uh, um, uh, before you start um, thinking about, hey, what are your what are your palpatory skills here? Just keep touching animals. Um, figure out something um, about each animal. All of I agree on that. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say I totally agree with that because a lot of us too, especially if you're in general practice or if you're doing an internship out after school or whatever. Um, sometimes being able to really incorporate acupuncture at the beginning can be a little bit challenging. And so I think that the, um, the best advice I can give is, is to palpate everything. Even if you're seeing a patient for vomiting and diarrhea, as you're palpating their abdomen or as you're assessing something else, palpate all of your anatomical landmarks, thinking about that in the back of your mind. Um, because um, I think Emily asked the question of what else besides neuro do we use acupuncture for? And the answer is everything. So whether it's a dry eye, whether it's otitis, whether it's vomiting or diarrhea, whether it's autoimmune, you know, I mean, whether it's skin issues and I mean, you can use acupuncture for everything. Um, big one, um, obviously still somewhat controversial, is how we um, manage cruciates and torn cruciates versus from an orthopedic surgeon perspective. Um, and so palpating everything, getting to know some of those really mild changes before they get to a, a bad state. Um, is really, really important. And so under anesthesia, Nancy, that's brilliant. I wish I would have known that 20 years ago. That's awesome. Good job. I'll even go a little bit further on that too, is sometimes you'll get referred patients for a specific condition. I can count on both my hands, sadly, patients that were referred to me for hip arthritis, elbow arthritis, that sort of thing. And as you palpate more and more, you actually discover that, hey, that's, you know, an osteosarcoma, or I've discovered, you know, other issues. And if you hadn't, palpated and compared, you know, left and right hip and palpate together, you are, you're going to pick up on those really subtle changes. I've sent a couple patients in that I'm like, you know, we're not symmetrical here, go get a radiograph. And it was really, really early osteosarc. And then we've caught it early enough and we can just give them a better quality of life earlier. Um, so that's really key too, is just that palpation and knowing what things feel like you can pick up on those subtle, subtle abnormalities that you wouldn't necessarily find. Right, right. Um, and I would think too in our palpation, we're picking up comorbidities as well. So you mm -hmm. have these neurologic patients that in degenerative myelopathy or IBDD or whatever the case may be. And then as you're palpating, wow, that's a super arthritic knee. And it's easy to go, okay, well, it's got DM. I'm going to worry about the neurologic aspect, but we have to treat the arthritis and the comorbidity present as well, um, or we're going to not have much success with those patients. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And every single patient, I like to get a thorough history, even if I'm seeing them for you know, just arthritis, if they have kidney issues or they have elevated liver enzymes, it's really easy to add in just a few more needles and you can treat that as well. 
while you're treating whatever the primary issue is. Um, yeah, so um, to, can, I know to, we often get, oh, sorry. You're okay. Yeah. Nope, go ahead. <laughs> uh, to continue the um, Misha's thoughts about Emily's questions about um, how often you use acupuncture in cases other than neuro, yes, we use it for everything. So um, we'll have an animal um, that's hospitalized, say, for HGE. Um, I can help that animal's abdominal cramping um, with acupuncture needles. Honestly, I might be able to slow the horrific um, amount of ick that's coming out of an, an HGE dog um, uh, and hopefully also get it home faster. So we'll use acupuncture as part of pain control for our surgical patients, part of pain control for our dental patients. Again, this is a way you can talk to your boss about how you can add it in, that if there's an acupuncturist in the house, um, it's a fairly cost effective measure on um, the practice to ask you, hey, as you're swinging past um, recovery um, ward, um, can you put a few needles in someone? You can teach um, your nurses to be able to do that or um, CuraCore has a course for nurses that's a better choice so that they um, are experienced and understand what um, to look for and how to help you as a practitioner um, with your acupuncture cases. And um, then, yeah, I love the idea of treating um, your derm cases, um, your IBD cases. I see a few animals that we control their IBD um, with mm -hmm. acupuncture and other, and a couple of other modalities, diet stuff like that. But um, uh, virtually everything. Um, so I'm a huge fan of treating internal med cases with acupuncture, um, neuro cases, musculoskeletal cases, like Alyssa's talking about, um, oncology patients. Um, I can get up a, an amazing soapbox and talk about the quality of life that you can give to oncology patients with acupuncture. And I know that LASA, and I don't know if everybody's already um, gotten their little packages from LASA as far as all the different kinds of needles, but I mean, you have those for a reason. I saw Amy just ask, can you start using them on cases? Um, well, you're a veterinarian and you've gone through the modules and now's the time to practice, right? When you come down to see us, we hone your skills and we help your myofascial palpation a little bit deeper. And we talk a little bit more about electroacupuncture and practice, 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 practice. But there's no reason you can't start practicing on cases now. Um, and I actually would recommend that you do that. And even if it's a matter of just starting with your big points that Dr. Robinson has laid out for you and get those so they are so cemented in your brain. By the time we see you in a year, you're just going to be rock stars. And then every once in a while, look at the book and go, what other points could I potentially be using um, in this area because I'm feeling some issues that I need to address. And so, yes, I do think you should be treating. I don't know what you guys think, so think, but that's kind of my opinion on it. I think it's important to be able to palpate your bladder line. And then it's also really helpful, especially in those internal medicine cases, is know your back shoe points. And can you find L2, L3, and you know you're at bladder 23, and then you get the kidney, and then you can practice that palpation. Because just going back to kind of questions that we see at the course, I feel like the bladder line is one of the biggest issues. And practice palpating ribs and counting, practice palpating your vertebra and counting, and then know your back shoe points. Then you could, you know, if you have a liver dog, pop it in, and kidney dog, pop it in, and just you can practice just placing needles, being able to know where your bladder line is and knowing where those organ systems are and how you can address those with the bladder line, I think is a good starting place too in practice. Right. I know you guys have a lecture on safety um, and I would encourage you to review that lecture on safety. There's um, you know, a couple of uh, handy tips are make sure you never hub your needles because um, the hub is where the needle is the most fragile. Um, so don't do that. Um, uh, um, having an assistant with you is very handy to make sure that accidentally your animal doesn't necessarily lay down on their needles. 
um, or if they're going to lay down, you know, if an animal's in um, sternal recumbency and then goes into lateral recumbency, um, if you're treating trigger points over the lats on the left side, um, if your pet patient um, is going to potentially lay down, either stay with that needle. Um, so I'm going to use a pen because I don't have an acupuncture needle. Um, so you could um, place your acupuncture needle and then stay with it and just stay there and then just pull it um, if you need to, rather than placing it, leaving it there, and then the animal flumps over on top of that needle. Um, so being a little bit um, aware of, um, of um, I usually ask the students to kind of play a, a game of worst case scenario, um, what would happen in a worst case scenario. So if you're putting an acupuncture needle, oh, this is gonna be hilarious. Um, um, here um, on a dog, you um, might be able to just, oh wait, does anybody know what this point's called? Come on, come on, it could be fun. <laughs> Who's gonna play? Come okay. on, I know there's students out there. Um, so, um, so if you're gonna place an acupuncture <laughs> like this, um, pretend I'm a dog. So um, every human basically has a pug skull. Okay, you've got it. You're I'm a pug. Um, so if I put it <laughs> like this, um, then um, if I were a dog and I fell over on my head, um, uh, then uh, that might not be too terrible. Um, I'm sorry, it would be, it could be terrible because what could happen to my needle? That would be bad. Um, um, uh, so I might instead try placing my needles this way. Um, again, I might not place my needle this way because um, it could go like that. And in a dog, remember, they don't have a complete orbit, but a cat does. Um, so knowing a little bit about, about your anatomy and thinking through a little bit of needle safety, needle placement um, can be a good um, exercise to do um, at home now um, while you're um, practicing. Um, having an assistant with you can also help just to make sure nobody eats a needle accidentally. Um, um, that's a bad thing. Um, um, it, um, if, if people always ask, what do you do if that happens? Um, honestly, transparency with a pet parent is the best choice. Um, be transparent. Um, if you need to take an x-ray, you need to refer them to someone who take, can take an x-ray for you. Um, if you're a house call practitioner, that's all fine. Um, uh, for us, we have, again, if I know I have, oh, the classic Labrador who eats everything that drops on the floor, um, I'm gonna, if I have needles on front limbs, I'm either gonna stay with that needle, like I just showed you with the pen, um, or if it's on front limbs, what I might do is place my needles on the front limbs, and if the animal's laying down, place a towel over those needles, so that that way they um, would have to move the towel to get to the needles and an assistant still helps so that that way they can watch over that. Um, having an assistant that can keep the animal entertained, tra um, trained, um, things like that. And yes, Emily, you win. It is gallbladder one. Nice job. <laughs> okay. Good job. Um, um, uh, so, um, uh, but those things can help if you're putting- Do you use popsicles, Nancy? We use uh, frozen baby foods um, and as um, as snackables, um, Cheerios. We use a lot of Cheerios. Um, uh, they're low calorie, um, mm -hmm. GI friendly, um, and we, we happen to see a lot of animals that have um, GI disturbances. Um, that's sometimes what we're seeing them for. Um, mm -hmm. uh, low calorie, easy to digest. Um, they're generally like pancreatitis friendly stuff like that. So we use a lot of Cheerios too. But a lot of frozen snacks. We have we have the, in the, um, like cat treats. You know the yogurt popsicle mm -hmm. looking things for cats. The yeah. cats love them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And yogurt. Yeah. We have a lot of yogurt. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. So I don't have an assistant. I work alone. Um, so when I have to do stuff in a front leg, I'll usually phase my treatments, and so I'll focus on just the front leg, and I usually will start on it. Cause I'm right there. I can get my needles in and I just gave them their frozen baby food. So they're really focused on that. They haven't gotten bored yet. Um, and then once they're seeming to maybe start looking around more, then I'll take those needles out and then I can move to the back end of the dog and then treat another area when they're a little bit less distracted or sorry, more distracted. Right. 
Right. Yeah, and having an assistant or somebody with you in tr for treating um, cats and exotics because they don't tend to be as food motivated as the dogs. Some kitties are, um, but it, that is really important and really helpful. And especially for those patients, like Nancy was talking about needles being on the face, uh, making sure that they their the needles are outside of their peripheral vision is really really important because if they see something that's going to trigger them to want to swat at it or you know lick at it or something else and so having somebody or just like you said Alyssa really focusing on just that one part of the body and staying with those needles so that they're minimize any potential um, eating or chewing or ingesting of them um, or like Nancy said going someplace that you don't want them to is really important. Have you had um, any needles eaten? One. You have? Yeah. 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 Red. I had one show up on that it. I had to pry out of a chocolate lab's mouth. <laughs> yeah. Surprise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know the other question we often get is about aggressive dogs and how we manage that. Um, people ask about sedation and things like that. I don't see my patients. I never have. I don't know how that interferes. Maybe um, Diane can comment too. You can see her commenting on the side. Um, but we have, and we see at least sometimes 90 patients a week. And I think I've had to muzzle two dogs um, since I started doing this and one was more as a precaution and as he got more and more familiar with coming in we were able to take him a popsicle and he was fine however he did try and eat a needle once as well <laughs> so we had to kind of watch him carefully but um, I don't know about you guys whether you end up using muzzles or how you manage some of the aggressive dogs. I have kind of a cool story just that pertains to this week I started seeing a dog I think it was in January and he he was just super super painful so he had that pain aggression um, and so I did initially start with muzzling but I started with some laser and then some massage and we did a lot of exercises for rehab beforehand and then as time went on I've been able to needle him and just this week he did so great the last time I saw him that, and it, because I'm working completely alone, I was kind of hesitant to not use a muzzle. But this week I decided that I wanted to try it. And he let me needle him, laser him, do everything that I needed to do. And I think it's just because I established that trust with him. Um, and yeah. eventually, you know, you're not a threat anymore. They know they feel better after and they do a lot, really well. Right. We're, we're a fear-free certified practice. Um, and uh, so we see a lot of animals that are very, it's uh, called FAS, that they're fear, anxiety, stress animals that um, the veterinarian alone is a trigger for them, um, never mind if they're in pain or anything like that. So we see a lot of those patients because that's part of what we do. Um, and uh, the majority of our acupuncture, acupuncture patients and the majority of our general patients actually love coming to the vet. Um, again, if you're talking to your boss and your boss is thinking mm -hmm. about your free certification, um, I would say go for it. Um, but acupuncture uh, blends nicely into a fear-free practice. Um, the majority of acupuncture patients end up loving come to, coming to the vet. The majority of who we end up seeing, even though they're FAS patients, they actually drag. Um, uh, they want to come into the building. They jump on the scale. They go running into their room. They jump on the dog bed or the kitty cats even. It's a big deal, I think, for veterinarians to say the majority of our cats don't hate us. Um, mm -hmm. at the hospital um, they actually that's a big deal for a cat to think of it as at least a neutral experience if not an enjoyable experience um, we do acupuncture a fair number of cats um, um, and that can work really well again um, if you're talking to your boss that uh, a lot of practices are talking about how do they um, get more cats to come into the building um, acupuncture can be um, a resource and a revenue generator to build cat cat attitude in this um, cat practice. Um, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. We see quite a few cats. I love cats. I think cats are super rewarding. Yeah. Yeah, um, they super. respond really, really well to laser and acupuncture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a question about compassion, fatigue, burnout, depression. I would say 
Um, I think there's risk in what we do, no matter um, how we're doing it, whether it's through acupuncture or general practice. I think we, because we care, and especially with patients that we're seeing sometimes weekly, I think the risk of compassion fatigue um, is still there. Um, but I think you can manage your time a little more greatly too, especially if you own your own mobile practice or acupuncture business um, to try and prevent that from happening. I think such a team approach, um, we kind of debrief as a team constantly. We do it at lunch and then we do it sometimes at the end of the day if we've had a rough day or we've had you know, one client at a that's maybe not been happy with us and you know those are the ones you tend to remember and they tend to stick with you um and so i think having a team that you can debrief with um Alyssa doesn't have that so how do you avoid compassion fatigue and and burnout Alyssa? i think the number one thing that has really with my practice that i've done that's helped me is getting a second phone um, and having a complete separate work phone and at 7 p.m my phone turns off and it goes away um, it's away for the weekends i took my email off of my personal phone so that I can just completely shut shut off because it really mobile's hard because now they know they have a direct communication with you they're able to text you they can call you in the middle of the night and they know that you're on the other end of the phone um, so that does initially it got to be a lot with a few clients that have used that most people are very respectful um, but I found it really helpful just having this group and Danielle and I talk a lot. I've reached out to Nisha before with questions on cases and just having people that I can reach out to and talk to and, Hey, I have this issue happening. And, um, can I talk through it with you? Or I have this weird case. Um, I don't know what to do with has really, really helped you. You have to make an effort to do it. Um, cause your spouse will get tired of you <laughs> complaining to them. Mm -hmm. But yeah. For us, acupuncture does help our whole team um, um, with compassion fatigue, burnout, depression. Um, I, I know I've said it already, but um, four of our doctors do acupuncture and they talk about, um, they, uh, they share that, hey, they love acupuncture cases because it gives them a break from some of the other things that they need to do each day. You do get to build a bond with those pet parents. You build a bond with the animals. You know, we all got into veterinary medicine because um, we love the animals, right? Um, and so those appointments are nice because you get to actually spend that time um, with those pet parents, with those animals, and you get to do them good. Um, uh, sometimes in veterinary medicine, we have appointments or we have days where it feels like all you're saying is, I'm so sorry, Mrs. Jones, your pet has blank. Um, whatever the blank is, and those acupuncture appointments um, can help. For us, we put acupuncture, um, we mix it into all of our appointments. Uh, so you might see an acupuncture appointment, a wellness appointment on a, on a normal day, um, um, a puppy. Um, and then you might see, you know, a couple of oncology, oncology cases or some internal med cases or something like that. Um, so acupuncture helps. Um, um, I'm putting air quotes around that, but break that, break up um, some of the other things we do in veterinary medicine. The nurses literally argue about, um, in a friendly way, um, we, we make jokes about, okay, you get to have thumb wars over who gets to do what, um, but the nurses will have thumb wars over who gets to help with certain acupuncture cases because it's very rewarding for them also. Um, uh, it helps relieve their compassion fatigue. Um, they also get to bond with those animals, bond with those pet parents, um, and those animals they walk in they adore coming into the practice um, so it really helps the nurses also to combat compassion fatigue um, by incorporating acupuncture into the practice um, yeah and Daria the question there about emergency uh, yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. go ahead Danielle Oh, no, I'm like, I don't, because so we don't do a lot of emergency medicine, clearly. Um, I don't do general practice anymore, but um, I know the local uh, emergency clinic just down the street, of grad, and, um, you know, I think she's busy trying to deal with emergencies, but constantly I'm reminding her to use it because, you know, in emergency, you're seeing um, respiratory arrest, and you guys should know your points for that. 
um, you are seeing cardiac issues, you are seeing painful cases, um, you are seeing renal cases, and I think um, there's there's all kinds of ability to incorporate that in. From a financial standpoint, I know um, there was a doc that used to, um, if they were an in-hospital patient, it was just an add-on because she didn't have to have a whole acupuncture appointment set aside with the owner. She could go by the cages and treat them and then move along to the next. And I think, so adding a little add-on acupuncture to their hospital stay um, is definitely one way to incorporate it in. I don't know if anyone else has anything to add. Uh, yeah, I think in urgent and emergency care, it's, and Alyssa can definitely speak to this, but those are the situations where it is way, way vital that you have an assistant um, that is comfortable, confident in monitoring those painful or cardiac or respiratory patients who have needles in place. Um, because as urgent care and emergency, you don't have time always to sit with your patient for 20 to 40 minutes and really watch them and monitor them and things like that. You've got to be moving on to the next thing um, in, it, most of the time. And so having a technician that you trust to sit with that patient or whoever is responsible for taking that patient's vitals or doing their treatments um, is really, really important. Um, but like Nancy said, incorporated into everything, you know, um, any patient that comes in for whatever reason, um, you won't necessarily need to do a, or have the opportunity to do a full body acupuncture treatment. But in ER, I mean, getting a few needles in just for um, whatever their presenting problem is, even though your exam will find comorbidities. Um, yeah, I think that as long as you've got a technician or you've got somebody to sit with that patient, um, you can incorporate it into any of your cases. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think um, Dr. Robinson asked a question about how we're managing cruciates, and I think cruciates are probably one of the biggest phone calls we're getting right now because none of the surgeons are cutting, um, or very few. I would say the big referral centers um, have shut down any non-urgent um, surgeries, which would include um, TPLOs and TTAs. And so um, we are getting a ton. So we are doing telemedicine for them, but the ones that are we are bringing into the hospital as well, and we can do acupuncture. Are you guys doing a lot of acupuncture in your cruciates, like acute cruciates right now? Yeah, absolutely. And laser. Mm -hmm. Yeah, love a little bit. Are you guys doing a lot of telemedicine? Yes. Like Zoom appointments and stuff? Yeah. Um, Zoom I've, had, I've had a few, but um, we are still doing curbside, you know, services. And so we're so we're just slam packed busy right now, even with curbside things that um, that not too many people that we have not we have it set up to do um, telemedicine, but not have not needed it too much. We've been able to get most people in. A lot okay. of my patients already have established, um, you know, home exercise plans. They already have a CC loops. They already have massage techniques that I've taught them. Um, so I, I'm not finding that anyone really needs that from me because the ones that are really painful are the ones that I'm going to see. Um, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, I think these are more cruciates that we have no choice but to conservatively manage them. And so, uh, pre I, I mean, I think our regulations are a little different in Ontario, but previous to this, we were not allowed to do telemedicine unless we had a valid patient-client relationship, and that had to be an in-person um, visit. So right now they've waived that. So we can do an initial assessment through telemedicine and then give advice based on that. So I think, especially to reduce the flow in the clinic, um, my technician on her days off, because she's working less per week, will do a telemedicine consult. And at least we can, we have actually, I don't know, just coincidentally, she had uploaded a million videos to our YouTube on how to do range of motion and how to do walking and how to do sit to stands. And so we can select from those 
dogs and send them to the owner and say, can you make the dog do this and assess how capable are they to do that, assess their gait um, and get a better idea. And then we can kind of tailor a plan a little bit more. And if they look like they are three legged and they are super painful, then we can say, okay, you know what? You need to come in and we need to get our hands on. Yeah, um, we've been using- And it's seven. Um, we. <laughs> Holy cow. I know, right? So you've um, been using what, Nancy? We've been using telemedicine, the case I mentioned earlier in this hour about um, facial paralysis and one of our um, cases we started this week of lumbosacral stenosis. Um, and we started those as telemedicine cases, um, you know, telling the pet parent, hey, we can do this at home. It was really entertaining to get a pet parent um, to do a whole facial nerve exam for me. Um, it actually worked really well. Um, <laughs> And the pet was excited. She was like, this is great, you know. Um, and then when we talked out options, we said, hey, look, um, your pet has um, has facial nerve paralysis. Do you want to see a neurologist? Do you want to come see us? Um, we we had worked with that pet patient before with acupuncture, with other, uh, a different neurologic disorder. And she was like, can we just come bring him in for acupuncture? So we started that case as a telemedicine case. Um, uh, it was it was actually really neat to be able to get a pet parent to do a neuro exam for me. Um, that was uh, great. Um, and likewise, the one of the patients we started this week as a, a that we now know as a lumbosacral stenosis um, kid um, started as a telemedicine and got that pet parent to do a modified neuro exam for us too. That pet parent couldn't do all of the reflexes we needed to know, uh, but could do some things enough to let us know, hey, we can see this patient, should we x-ray this patient, can we start getting um, this patient better? Um, so yeah, it can work It can work as a good adjunct. Um, right. Yeah. Absolutely. So do we have any, um, kind of, do we want to give any words of wisdom as before we kind of say goodbye to everybody? Um, I think mine would be, you get your lots of needles. Um, I would have a nice, you can always order some more. So you have a nice selection. If you do want to do cats, make sure you have some kind of coated, uh, low gauge, like reds, greens, um, and then even some, maybe a couple uncoated. Um, I like my carbos um, because they're not too ouchy and they stay in better than the serins, but getting used to what those feel like um, when you're practicing is a good idea. And just make sure you just keep palpating, 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 because that's what you're going to be doing when you see us in October. And um, we want to, and we'll be harder on you because you have that much longer now to practice. <laughs> I won't be harder on you. <laughs> um, um, no. I guess my word is anybody else. Um, get to know other practitioners in your area and maybe, you know, hopefully some of the regulations will be lifted and perhaps before October, you can go and shadow someone and just establish a local base of who you can bounce ideas off of and questions off of and just get to know people really well. I would tell you, um, start, start practicing acupuncture. Um, uh, review your anatomy. You guys already know this. Um, review your acupuncture points. You guys already know this and start doing it. Um, uh, the, we meet folks every time um, through acupuncture class. Some folks really are here just for the CE. That's okay. Some folks honestly come back um, to, to relearn ac their um, neuroanatomy and their um, um, their whole anatomy, muscles, uh, joints, bones, uh, neuroanatomy, all of that. Um, and some folks are really here to uh, learn an, an additional skill, a great adjunct of skill. Acupuncture can become an amazing tool in your toolbox. I know all of us would agree that acupuncture has changed the way we practice veterinary medicine in so many ways. Um, it's made this um, uh, to have less compassion fatigue. It's made practice to be um, fun again um, for us to all go back and and do what we love, work with the animals. Um, and it can be such a huge adjunct, such a huge practice builder, such a huge bond-centered concept, um, and such a fear-free concept. Um, I would encourage all of you to start practicing. 
Absolutely. And I agree with all that. And my words of wisdom would just be to every single patient that you put your hands on, just think in the back of your mind, like, what is this point and what does it help with? And um, just constantly be thinking about it because um, as we've all known from things in life, if you don't use it, you you can tend to lose some of that knowledge. And so just with every single patient that you touch, no matter the species, no matter, um, you know, a great Dane down to a little teeny tiny teacup poodle um, or baby kitten or whatever, just keep touching them and just keep thinking about um, the acupuncture knowledge that you have gained through the module so far, because that will allow it to all come into more of a whole complete picture. Right. Perfect. Well, um, everybody have a wonderful evening and I'm going to try eventually to upload this to YouTube. So anyone um, sign up for the course who has some questions um, can watch it later and answer some of those for you. Um, all of us are available by email um, through the CuraCore website. If you have any questions, we are always open to answer um, and have a great night. Hey. Night, y'all. Night. Night.